Good evening and welcome to our service here in Ballyclare Evangelical Presbyterian Church. And if you're able to join with us there this evening, you're most welcome. We trust that you'll know something of the presence and blessing of God as we seek his face together. Let's turn to him now in prayer. Our God, our Father in heaven, thank you for every provision that you've made for us in this day that has quickly sped by. Thank you that we're able to reflect upon your loving kindness, upon your goodness and upon your mercy, and to speak of pardon for sin and a peace that endureth. We pray, O oh God, that you would remember us now as we meet together. Remember us in a great blessing, we pray. Come down to us. Remember those who can't be with us this evening and bless them and do them good. Those who are sorrowing, those who are sad, those who are worried, those who are worn with care. Hear our prayer for Jesus' sake. Amen. We're going to read in the book of Hebrews in chapter 8. We've been looking through Hebrews now for some months. We've come into chapter 8. We looked at the first uh, five or six verses there last Tuesday evening. We're going to read the whole chapter from verse 1 and down to verse 13. So Hebrews chapter 8, verse 1, and down to verse 13. Let us hear God's word. Now, this is the main point of the things we are saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the Lord erected and not man. For every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. Therefore it is necessary that this one also have something to offer. For if he were on earth, he would not be a priest, since there are priests who offer the gifts according to the law, who serve the copy and shadow of the heavenly things, as Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle. For he said, See that you make all things according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry, inasmuch as he is also mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second. Because finding fault with them, he says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they did not continue in my covenant, and I disregarded them, says the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. None of them shall teach his neighbor, and none of none his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least of them to the greatest of them. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. In that he says a new covenant, he has made the first obsolete. Now what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. We thank God for the reading of his holy word. We'll come back to that very shortly. But before we do that, we're going to turn to God in prayer. Let us pray. Our God, our Father in heaven, we are glad to draw near to God. In that sure and certain knowledge, we have a promise that says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. And so, Lord, we claim the promise this evening. The way that we're meeting is not the way that we would desire to meet we belong to be gathered with one another in the presence of God. Uh, and yet, Lord, it seems that for this present time that uh, would not seem to be a, a wise thing. But we thank you that we can gather in this way and be together around the throne of God above. We thank you for the great privilege that is ours. And we thank you, Lord, that we can make the most of our difficulty. Thank you for that wonderful example of Daniel who threw open his windows, windows and prayed to God, even though he was many hundreds of miles away from the temple. And we praise you and bless you, Heavenly Father, that we can do just the same in meeting together 
that we can be sure of meeting together in the presence of God. We pray your blessing upon us tonight. Um, at the end, perhaps, of a, a, a busy and a, a tiring and a weary day, Lord, we pray that you'd give us your grace, that we may hear you speak, that we may know the blessing of God from on high, and that we may then, O oh God, in time, be able to meet together and um, to pray one with the other. We pray that you'd remember all who are needy. We're especially mindful of those who are sad at this present time, those who've uh, lost a loved and dear one, and we commend them to your blessing and grace. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you would be pleased to meet their need and to help them through difficult days. We pray that you would remember one and all. We, we think of mums and dads tonight, but perhaps especially mums, on whom so much of uh, this home teaching is falling. Remember them, O oh God, and do them good, we pray. Keep them from being worn away with the demands of it all and grant them grace. And for their children, we pray, Heavenly Father, that they would uh, readily learn and that they would be greatly concerned uh, to hear uh, their lessons and to learn the lessons that their teachers have sent down and, and mums and dads then seeking to pass on to them. We pray, Lord, that you would bless folk who are working really, really hard and for whom there, there never seems to come a break, really. There, ne there never seems to be um, time. We pray, O oh God, do them good and bless them and encourage them. <coughs> We thank you that we can <clears throat> turn into your holy presence in the sure and certain knowledge that you care for us. And so, Lord, demonstrate that care, we pray, in further grace in this incoming week. We do thank you for your word, and we do pray that the word would uh, forge a great and powerful impression upon our hearts. We pray for your Holy Spirit. We pray that he would take his word up and wing it home. And, O oh God, that we may better know you, better love you, better understand you and better serve you. Remember us, we pray. <clears throat> and remember us, O oh God, to cleanse us from sin and from wrong and from evil, all of which are to be found in our hearts. Deal with us mercifully and deal with our sister congregations who will also meet in some way or other tonight and bless them and do them good, we pray. Lord, hear our prayer. Remember us in the multitude of your mercies because we pray these are prayers in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we have been um, looking into the book of Hebrews. It's a wonderful book. It takes a little bit of understanding, that's for sure. It's written in the first instance to Christians who came from a Jewish background. They've uh, somewhat lost the way. They've become discouraged. They made a great start in the Christian life. But there's been opposition and there's been difficulty. And they've pulled back. Um, it's the sort of hedgehog uh, syndrome, isn't it? And we, we too can pull back at times in the Christian life. We can get hurt. We uh, can feel that uh, things have not been fair and so on um, in, in dealings in, in life. And, and we can pull back. We can all do that. It's understandable. Um, and these folk, they felt that life was just too hard, really, to handle. They've pulled back. And they've lost sight of our Lord Jesus Christ. And they've reverted really to their roots and that their roots were in that Jewish faith and so much of the external. And so there was the temple, there uh, were the priests, there were the sacrifices, there were the, 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 the ceremonial laws and, and so on. And, and all of these things um, furnished them with, with sight and with sense. And they've run back to that uh, theme of sight, sight and sense. Um, and instead they've, they've lost sight to some extent, of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the great theme of the book is that they look unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of their faith. And we've seen much in these um, recent weeks about the fact that our Lord Jesus Christ is our great high priest. And that's certainly been the theme as we've um, come through chapter 6 and 7, and even then into chapter 8. And do you remember that summation point in verse 1 of chapter 8? Now, this is the main point of the things we are saying, we have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. And we thought of our Lord Jesus Christ there, sort of in summary form really, drawing on the earlier chapters, but in summary form. And we can say of him that we have a great high priest. He has sat down. He has sat down in the heavens. He's not the shadow. He's the fulfillment. And in having the Lord Jesus Christ, we have all and everything. Now, the remainder of Hebrews in chapter 8 speaks to us of the greater covenant arrangement 
under which this great high priest is ours. And you can see immediately then, um, as we come into the verses that we're looking at tonight, from verse 6 and down, that this word covenant starts to appear. But, at verse 6, but now he has obtained a more excellent ministry inasmuch as he's also mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second, because finding fault with them, he says, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, and so on. And you can see this word covenant um, coming up a whole series of times here in this passage. There's a very big quote there from the book of Jeremiah and chapter 31. And we probably won't go into all the details of that this evening, but um, it's going to be used to demonstrate to us that there is a better arrangement, a better covenant um, belonging to the, to, to, the, to, to the sphere, to the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Three little headings then that we're going to use tonight. A covenant compared, there's a comparison going on here. A covenant compared, a covenant completed. And we'll draw upon the fact that this uh, second covenant, and we'll explain what we mean by that in a moment or two, is complete. The work of our Lord Jesus Christ is done. And then we'll um, move on just a little bit further and we'll speak of the fact uh, or speak um, along the line of a covenant continued. A covenant continued. A covenant compared. A covenant completed. A covenant continued. Now, um, first of all then, under that heading, a covenant compared, we've seen um, this repeated emphasis on our Lord Jesus Christ and on his great high priesthood. He's greater, that's the point, isn't it, than all those Levitical priests. He's patterned on that priesthood of that um, strange and eerie figure in Genesis in chapter 14, Melchizedek. And um, especially important about Melchizedek, his name, um, he's the king of Salem, the king of peace. He's uh, the king of righteousness, um, Melchizedek. Um, but, but added to that, there, there's no record of his beginning and there's no record of his ending. He's rather an eerie figure. And our Lord Jesus Christ is patterned on that man. King of righteousness, king of peace, and with no beginning and with no end. He's our eternal um, high priest, isn't he, in that sense? And to drive that home further now, the writer book of Hebrews um, wants to speak of the covenant arrangement under which um, those Levitical priests were priests and under which our Lord Jesus Christ is priest. He's going to make a comparison, a covenant compared. And he talks now of a better covenant. He's the mediator of a better covenant. Look at verse 6. But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry. We can be sure about that, says the writer of Hebrews, inasmuch as he is also <clears throat> mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. So, first of all this evening, um, I've highlighted this word covenant. Let's ask the question, well, what, what do you mean by covenant? What is a covenant? You hear that word used, sometimes people quote it in church and so on. What do we mean actually by covenant? Well, a covenant is an arrangement. If you like, it's a deal. It's the terms on which we trade, if I can put it like that, trying to help us understand. Um, there's this difference. It's a deal in a sense, uh, but it's different in this way that all the terms are put in place, not out of negotiation, um, but rather they're set by God. Now, we've had the Brexit negotiation and it's gone on and on and so on. And who knows what we feel about the outcome of that? Um, was it a negotiation? Were the terms being you know, forced and, and, and so on? Is it a good deal? Who, who knows? Time, I suppose, will tell. Make no mistake that when we think of a covenant, the, the terms on, under which we trade with God, if you like, um, it, it's, it's a two-sided arrangement in the sense 
that uh, God makes promises to us, but God expects us to keep our promises to him. It's a two-sided arrangement in that sense. I think we need to be careful to remember that because it's possible to quote the covenant as if it's all God giving to us. Well, it's a two-sided arrangement in that sense. But the terms are set by God alone. Now, to see that, oops, probably the best place um, to see that is in the book of Genesis and in chapter 17. Genesis and chapter 17. Um, The context is that uh, God had uh, worked in Abraham's heart. He brought salvation to this man's heart. He'd been brought from Ur of the Chaldees. He's been uh, brought into the land of Canaan. God has promised to bless him and his family and all the nations of the world, all the families of the earth in in this man. He's struggling because um, he and his wife, Sarai, at this point, um, have no children. Time is moving on. They're getting desperate. Where is this promise that God has made? And you know that, um, very sadly, in Genesis and chapter 16, they strike out and they do something very foolish. It's on Sarai's suggestion, and the idea is that Sarah, that uh, Abraham rather, should get together with um, Sarai's handmaid, uh, a girl called Hagar. It's outrageous, but that's what Abraham does. A child comes of this illicit um, relationship, and uh, the child's name is Ishmael. Abraham thinks that he's got the answer, but the answer is not in Ishmael. And God seems to measured language, leave Abraham for a time. And so at the end of uh, chapter 16 of uh, the book of Genesis, we read Abraham was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to Abraham. And there's nothing then until chapter 17. 13 years go by. And the first verse of chapter 17 is so significant. The last verse of chapter 16 gives us his age then. The first verse of chapter 17 gives us his age now. When Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abraham and said to him, I am almighty God, walk before me and be blameless, and I will make my covenant between me and you, and I will multiply you exceedingly. God has come back after 13 years. Um, it, It looks as though it's 13 years of silence. 13 years of difficulty, 13 years of time for Abraham to think about what it is that he has done. But God graciously comes, and he comes with another covenant arrangement. Now, in a sense, there was already a covenant arrangement in place because God had made a promise. But the covenant arrangement now, if you like, is being firmed up. Here is God reaching out. He didn't have to, but he does. That's God. That's the amazing thing about, you know, the covenant, the covenant of grace. It's God reaching out. Always remember that. It's about God reaching out. There had been 13 years of empty waiting. But now God sets out a new arrangement. And it's important to notice it's God who sets it out. Um, Here are the terms, if you like, uh, under which the fence could be mended. Here are their new trading terms. Um, It's there um, in in sweeping terms in verse 1. When Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abraham and said to him, I am old, mighty God. Let's be clear about this. Who is God? Who is the Almighty? I am Almighty God. Walk before me and be blameless. I'm Almighty God. We can't have that kind of nonsense that you've been involved with, with Hagar. That's broadly the brushstroke there, isn't it? And then God says, I will make my covenant between me and you and multiply you exceedingly. And so here really is a reiteration of the promise that God had already given him, but it's going to be firmed up. Abraham falls on his face. God talks with him. My covenant is with you, and you shall be a father of many nations. No longer shall your name be called Abraham, but your name shall be called Abraham. It's always significant in Scripture when God changes someone's name. For I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, rather, and I will make nations of you, 
and uh, kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you in their generations for an everlasting covenant <clears throat> to be God to you and your descendants after you. Also, I will give to you and to your descendants after you the land in which you are a stranger. All the land of Canaan is an everlasting possession. I will be their God. And God said to Abraham, as for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you throughout their generation. So God says, I'm going to do this. You're to keep my covenant. Verse 10, this is my covenant. And God goes on to speak of the whole business of circumcision. Now, we don't want to get too lost in the details here tonight. But of course, the picture of circumcision is a, a picture of part of um, Abraham's anatomy being cut, part of his flesh being cut. There's great significance to the fact, um, of course, that it was that part of anatomy, his anatomy that had been in, involved in his relationship, um, or his act anyway, with, with Hagar in producing this child Ishmael. And now he's to be circumcised. The message was, flesh is not the answer. Man's way is not the answer. It has to be grace. And, you know, in cutting the flesh in this way, um, Abraham is acknowledging that. And he's saying flesh has to be the answer. It has to be the new birth. It has to be the way of God. It has to be regeneration. The old fleshly ways are not the answer. It has to be the new birth birth. Now, what a wonderful thing God does, and how amazingly kind God is, and how we should be overcome by the fact that God makes a covenant arrangement with us. God is a God who makes to us promises and who keeps his promises. The response of that from God's people should be that they be faithful to him. In broad brushstrokes, but it's that they be faithful to him. You know, talk um, there of uh, the, the lockdown and so on damaging the church. And yes, I, I'm sorry to say that probably is the, the case certainly in wider um, church life. It's really a measure of the faithfulness of God's people that we be faithful to him, that we be faithful to the means of grace, that we be faithful to these rather strained means of grace across the internet through this time of trial. Daniel and the whole business of Babylon would seem to me to be the pattern for this whole business. Daniel was away from his home. He probably would never return to his home. He's away from the temple. He's away from Jerusalem. We spoke of it with the children there on um, Sunday morning. Daniel comes under further test with, you know, the threat of the lion's den and so on. What did Daniel do? What had Daniel done? He's away. You know, he's away. You might have thought, well, he would stray from the things of God. He'd let the means of grace slip. He's away. He couldn't be there. He couldn't meet. You know, people are emphasizing this business of meeting together. We love to meet together. He couldn't meet. Was he faithful or was he unfaithful? Did he keep the covenant arrangement or did he break the covenant arrangement? He kept it. He opened his windows he faced, as it were, Jerusalem, and he called out to God. It's a great test for us um, in our day, in this particular day, isn't it? It's not easy, but it's a great test of God's people. And th this, this covenant arrangement requires of us that we be faithful. It tells us that God will bless, but it requires of us that we be faithful. But what we've got here in Hebrews in chapter 8 and at verse 6 is a comparison. So we're told the Lord Jesus Christ is the mediator of a better covenant. Um, and there's mention here of a first covenant and a second covenant. 
For, verse 7, if that first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second. Because finding fault with them, he says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, in which I will make a new covenant, a second covenant, with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they did not continue in my covenant. I disregarded them, says the Lord, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts and so on. I will be their God and they shall be my people. And there's mention here of the first covenant and of a new covenant. He quotes from Jeremiah chapter 31. And um, the, 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 the result um, is from uh, Jeremiah chapter 31. 38 and reading down the passage and coming then into verse 13 that he says a new in that he says a new covenant he has made the first obsolete now what is becoming obsolete shall grow old and is ready to vanish away now it's very important to be accurate in thinking about the bible and critically so at this point this talk here of an old and of a new what is he talking about it's critical that we get this right is it the Old and New Testaments? Is that what he's referring to here? No. No, that's not what he's referring to here. He tells us the first is obsolete. Well, <laughs> if he's referring to the Old Testament at that point, he, he's certainly quoting the Old Testament a lot, isn't he? So how can he be saying that the Old Testament is obsolete? He's not. No, it's important to emphasize that. Um, as he quotes here from Jeremiah, the older covenant is specified for us as the covenant that he made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. This isn't about the Old Testament as such. This is about that arrangement that God put in place when Israel came out of Egypt. When they came out, there were, through Moses, a whole series of additions, extras to the promise that had been made to Abraham. Abraham didn't have a tabernacle. Abraham didn't have a temple. Abraham didn't have a priesthood. Abraham didn't have all those ceremonial laws. He did, um, yes, from time to time make sacrifices, but there, there wasn't the detail of all that sacrificial system. No. You see, God introduced something extra. It was a means of teaching and instructing the minds of God pe God's people in their day. The, the tabernacle was so obvious to them it was in the middle of the tribes when they made their journeys they all were three to the north three to the south three to the the east and three to the west it was there right in front of them it had a lot of gold involved there was the ark of the covenant it all represented god and approaching god there were sacrifices involved there was that ceremonial law that spoke to them of their sinful hearts that made so clear that they could never live up to God's standard. It was all a means of teaching and instructing them. It was wonderful in its day, but it was going to be replaced. Now, these Hebrew Christians were stuck with a confidence in some of those old extras. That's the point that the writer of the book of Hebrews is making here. The tabernacle, the priesthood, the sacrifices... But in Christ, we have, he says, a better arrangement. There's a new deal. A new deal has been struck. And you see those old things, they're obsolete. They're, they're forgotten. I don't know if you're a hoarder or, 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 or what. But it can be the case, can't it, that you've got whatever it is and you decide, oh, that's, you know, it's a bit old now, we'll replace it. And it's replaced and then you hold on to the old one. Instead of throwing it out and being rid of it, it's obsolete or selling it on, whatever, you, you hang on to it. Well, um, that's really what they were doing here when what was new made the former 
obsolete. A covenant compared. Hope you can follow that. But a, a covenant completed. These Hebrew Christians were thinking a great deal of that old Mosaic or Levitical um, covenant. Now, what we need to be clear on is this, that God in history never changed his mind. Um, known unto God, we're told in Acts 15, are all his works from the beginning. You and I, um, maybe we've had to chop and change our minds today. A lot of that happens in our house and you have certain plans and there are times and, and so on. Um, and something will happen, the phone will ring, something else has to be done and, and the times will all change and the program will sort of fall apart and it all has to be revised. It reminds us of our humanity, doesn't it? It, it tells it, 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 it reminds us, you know, we're not God. We don't see what the whole day um, is ahead of us. We have to revise our, our, our days. God never had to remind, you know, to revise his days. He made that promise in Genesis 3 and verse 15 um, that he would, um, you know, bring about a seed through Eve and that that seed would revert this situation that had come into being where man was at enmity with God. No, God would turn that around. That, that promise gets um, reiterated in, in different ways, time after time after time. But God never changes um, what it is that he's doing. All along, um, the promise is that God would do wonderful things um, and that God would bring salvation. All along, God had his dealings planned out. And for a time, he restricts those dealings to, to dealing with one family, with Abraham. And going on from Abraham, um, he, he's going to pick up Abraham's family, isn't he? And he's going to deal with a certain part, um, you know, of that family. And he, he deals with Israel and so on. But all along, it was God's mind, it was God's plan that he was going to deal with all the nations of the earth. So we read in um, Genesis in chapter 12, get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now you see, for a time it was going to be limited to, to, to one, as it were, nation, to one family, to Israel. But it was always in God's mind that that would broaden. It was always that um, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. Yes, for a, for a time it was confined, but, but that uh, confinement didn't uh, last. It didn't endure. It was never intended to. It was always God's great and glorious purpose to, to reach all the families of the earth. Here we are in Galatians chapter 3, verse 8. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, In you all the nations shall be blessed. Says Paul, it was always God's plan. It was always God's purpose. So why then did all that stuff belonging to Moses, that you know, Levitical covenant or that Mosaic covenant, if you like, that arrangement that was put in place when they left the land of Egypt and they came to Mount Sinai and Moses is up and so on. Why did that arrangement have to come into place? Well, the reality is that all those sort of externals were added, the tabernacle, the sacrifices, the priesthood, those ceremonial laws. God had all those things added on for this reason that he might teach and instruct the people in the way that he wanted them to go. God gathers the people of Israel. He gives to them a whole series of extras. The law is written on stone. It's kept in the Ark of the Covenant. There's a temple or a tabernacle to start with and then a temple. There's a priesthood. There are these ceremonial laws. There are sacrifices. What for? Well, God put all these things into place. Abraham didn't have those things, but God put all of those things into place. It was a means of teaching the people. It spoke to them of sin. It spoke to them of a need, the need of a sacrifice. It spoke to them of God's holiness. It was a, a means of showing them the only way by which that they could be right with God. 
There was a repetition to those sacrifices. They never really dealt with sin. Animals could never really deal with sin. God was pointing on to the coming of his son. All this was, again, in the words of Galatians, this time down, again, chapter 3, but this time down at verse 24. All this was a means of pointing them to Christ. Therefore, Verse 24 of Galatians chapter 3. Therefore the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. All along, all of that stuff, this, um, you know, termed the law, all of that law that really was a ceremonial law had to do, it wasn't moral. It was ceremonial, generally, um, you know, sweepingly speaking, to, to drive into their, their, their mind's eye their, their need of one greater than these sacrifices, the Lord Jesus Christ. It was intended to focus their minds, to lead them to faith in the one who all along was to come. Now, for many of them, it never did that. But wonderfully, for some, it did. And when our Lord Jesus Christ came, there were people who were expecting his coming. We spoke of Anna a few weeks ago, just after Christmas there. We've spoken before of Simeon. And there were others who were there waiting the Lord's coming. There's Andrew. Talked of him briefly with the, the youngsters there on Friday evening. And he, he says to, 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 to Simon, doesn't he, come and see. We found the Messiah, the one that's promised. There was an expectation, you see, for some of them, that they, 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 they caught the picture. They got the drift. They understood the message. For many of them, that, that didn't happen. They just saw the externals. And their hearts were never turned toward God. But there were people there, and they got the message. Now, the point, <clears throat> really, that the writer book of Hebrews is making here tonight is all that stuff, with the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, all that stuff is no longer needed. It can go. The scaffolding can come down. With the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, with his ascension into heaven and the sending forth of his spirit, all um, that stuff um, can, can go. It's been superseded. Um, it's made obsolete and it can go. That, um, you know, that all that came with the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, the fact that he's the mediator of a better covenant, um, when he came onto the scene of time, uh, when his sacrifice was made, there was no more need for the, the pictures and the types and the shadows. All those things now go. And in addition, of course, with the fuller giving of God the Holy Spirit, all those ceremonial laws are gone. For he teaches us, he instructs us, through the word, through the New Testament that is written down for us. Here we are in, in the book of Acts. It wasn't easy for um, even the apostles to understand this changeover. And for a, for a while, you remember, they were very attached um, to, to, to the older system. And there was something new, but it took them a while for the, for the penny to drop. And we read in Acts in chapter um, 10, don't we, uh, to do with Peter. So Acts 10 and, and uh, verse 13, a voice came to Peter, rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, no, not so, Lord, um, for I have never eaten anything common or unclean, four-footed animals and so on, wild beasts, creeping things. And Peter gets this vision and uh, he says, well, I can't possibly eat those things. And a voice spoke to him again, verse 15, the second time, what God has cleansed, you must not call common. And, and yes, the, the Old Testament ceremonial law was there to say you, you shouldn't eat these things. That's gone. It was there. It taught them for a while, but it's gone. God's purpose has come to its fullness. Now God deals with all the nations. The day of Pentecost, God speaks um, you know, through those tongues. God speaks to all the nations. They hear everyone in his own language. They all hear in their own tongue because God is fulfilling the promise that was all along in place through Abraham to deal with all the families. 
And so that extra layer, if you like, of covenant, those um, extra bits and bobs, the, 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 the temple, the tabernacle, the priests, the sacrifices, they've been superseded. They're obsolete. These folk needed to grasp what they were starting to pine for. It was all gone. It was finished. God had moved on. What had gone had gone. It was an antiquity. A covenant compared, a covenant completed. But a covenant continued. Because it's important then um, for these folk to understand, but also for us to understand, um, and important to understand, really, the connection of the Old and New Testament. And the first thing I want to say under that is this, that um, you know, the new covenant that is referred to here doesn't mean lawlessness. Sadly, you get people who give the impression, who have the impression, I suppose, um, that in the Old Testament, people were saved by the law, by the keeping of the law. That somehow the New Testament is grace and the Old Testament was by keeping the law. That is a very serious mistake. And it leads on to a, another serious mistake. And the mistake is then, you see, that uh, law, all law, is cast away. And Christianity, or at least the outward look of Christianity, becomes lawless. You can get the attitude that um, you know, law has nothing to do with me. The, the, you know, the Old Testament has gone, cast all the commandments away. Notice verse 10. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. With the coming of God, the Holy Spirit, there are more intense dealings, if you like, with the heart. And we don't have, you know, the laws written out on stone in that box called the, the, the Ark of the Covenant in the tabernacle or in the temple. We have the law of God more directly to us, if you like, through his word. That was always there through his word, but it was accentuated through these other means, a means of teaching them. And, and you see, we wonderfully have this new covenant, all that, if you like, clutter, I don't want to be un, unfair, but all that clutter is taken away. And, and we simply have the words of God. And God says, I'll draw people close to me. My law will be written upon their hearts. They'll love me. They'll have a relationship with me. I will be their God. They shall be my people. So often Israel didn't look like the people of God at all. They were the people of God in name. But they didn't look like the people of God at all. No, you see, it was always um, that salvation was through faith, believing God's promise. Um, and the idea of law being the answer was, was never the case. It was a means of bringing us to see our need of Jesus. It was never by the law. At the same time, the law is still what tells us right and wrong. Add to that, secondly, that when we think of the covenant continued, God's promise and arrangement are still in existence. How careful that we don't jettison the Old Testament. These folk wanted to go back to the Old Testament, to, to the situation under Moses. But, um, you know, tragically the difference is in our day that Christians seem to want to jettison the Old Testament um, as if we can just forget it, uh, as if we don't need to care about it, we don't need to know it. And we don't need to apply it to ourselves. That's a terrible spurn to God. The Bible is one book. It's one book. And we have the great advantage of having the second part of the book. But that doesn't nullify the first part of the book, does it? There are things that are relevant to us there, in, in, you know, or more relevant to us in the first part than, than others. That ceremonial law, there's a lot that we can learn from it. But it's not ours to, to follow and to keep. There are principles that we can derive from it, but it's not for us to 
to be concerned about keeping the details. No, we need to hold a balance here. These people are going to go back to the, to the mosaic. No, that's finished. But we mustn't think that the Old Testament is finished. Indeed, you know, the, the New Testament is nonsense, isn't it, without the Old Testament? There's a third thing here that I just want to touch on very quickly. Um, it's, it's that this whole business here has implications for baptism. The truth that we're thinking through there this evening has particular importance for baptism. What part um, did children have in that covenant arrangement that was made with Abraham? Well, they had a very important part. It was unto Abraham and unto his seed. And we have this wonderful promise in God's covenant dealings that God deals not only with us, but with our children. Folks say, well, all that Old Testament stuff has gone. Yes, they were circumcised in the Old Testament, but that's nothing to do with the New Testament. Well, the detail of circumcision isn't, but its translation into baptism is. And wonderfully, we have the, the opportunity to baptize our little one. And all with the promise, you see, that God deals not just with us, but with our children. Now, don't mistake. Don't think that, you know, because God is the God of covenant or because our children may be termed um, covenant children, that that automatically makes them children of God. It doesn't. It doesn't. Don't think that that somehow releases us from the part that we have to play from our part in the covenant. It doesn't. There's nothing automatic in, in, in that. Nothing automatic. But we, we do know that if we, you know, careful, diligent, wise to walk with God, the promise is to us and to our children. And we, we can have this expectation that God will deal with the hearts of our little ones. The new covenant is a better covenant, says the writer of the book of Hebrews. And we need to be careful to hold on what, to, to what is new and to let slip, as it were, that which is now obsolete. How wonderfully privileged we are to belong to the part of history that we do. We can see it all in color. You've heard me use that language before. We can see the detail of what God did in his son, Jesus. Um, we don't look ahead, as it were. Of course, we look to the second coming, but we're not looking for the first coming of Christ in black and white. We can look back and see all the detail of what he did for us. Christ has completed his work on earth for us. He has shed forth his spirit. We're wonderfully privileged to have all that God wants to say to us <clears throat> in his word there completed in the New Testament. How privileged we are. These folk had their doubts. They wanted the sight. They wanted the smell. They wanted the noise. How careful to fasten our eyes upon Jesus and to be looking to him. There is, even in Christian circles in our day, a, a bit of a desire for the, for the noise, for the sight. No. We, we have a, a savior. He's not visible. But by faith, we're able to rest and trust in him. We know that he's passed into the heavens. We know that one day he's coming again for us. We, we need to gather these facts together and lay hold upon him in faith. Let's turn to God in prayer. Our Father, our God in heaven, thank you for your holy word. Thank you for that uh, new covenant. Thank you for your Holy Spirit dealing in our hearts. Thank you that we're told that you are our God, that we're your people. And help us, we pray, to look unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Help us to hold on to that new covenant. Help us to play our part Help us, O oh God, as you've promised to us to keep our promises to you. Help us in this difficult COVID day, we pray, to be faithful to God. Though we can't, as it were, meet in the way that we'd want to meet. Help us, Lord, to rise above that and to lay hold upon those wonderful promises and to know that as we seek to meet in this way, God will meet with us. This is our prayer to you in Jesus' name. Amen.